talk about something that's very prosaic compared to what we've heard before. And what I just like to, I don't have any uh, imaginative or great results to show you. I'm just going to tell you what I've been working on, which is to think about the day that we get lucky and we actually get to do one of these big weak lensing surveys. And somebody gives us our billion dollars or 300 million euros or whatever it is you're asking for. And uh, we get a catalog, uh, and this is even true for things that are about to start, you know, kids and DES uh, and PanStars. And we have to actually go and get cosmological inferences from this billion galaxy catalog. So are we going to be able to do that and end up with something that people will believe? Because okay. uh, if we're looking for a 1% change in the expansion history or growth history or something like that, there's a lot of other things that could occur at 1% that might potentially confound you. And so what I'm trying to do is do a comprehensive analysis of the experiments to look at all of the non-idealities of things that we ignore in our initial papers uh, and see if any of them will conspire to ruin the accuracy of our experiments. Okay. So the, the framework that I'm working in is where we try to uh, what would we like to have? We would like to have a, a tool for forecasting and analysis that uses all of the observables, all the clever ideas that people in this room and elsewhere have come up with over the last five or ten years, things that you could measure with gravitational lensing that would tell you something about cosmology. Uh, but they can be uh, added up in a pretty simple way. So what could we observe in an, ex an experiment? So we have an inferred lensing convergence field. So as has been mentioned, we might actually measure shear, but it's straightforward to turn it into convergence. So I'll use those words interchangeably. Uh, and we would have a convergence field for a whole bunch of different sets of galaxies that we've divided maybe by photometric redshift, but you could divide them by any criteria you want, you know, by their number in the UGC catalog. It doesn't matter. It's still a measurement. Uh, you could also use other things besides galaxies as your uh, lensing inference, say the CMB itself or 21 centimeter radiation or something. So you have a whole set of these lensing observables, the convergence observables. Then you also have density fields, say, of your galaxies, right, that you would in, uh, measure on the sky. Again, in the same bins as these, perhaps. Uh, another kind of information that we would get would be a, an unbiased spectroscopic redshift survey of the galaxies. Uh, and by unbiased, I mean that we know that we are sampling with equal probability. When we take a galaxy out of one of these bins here, uh, that we are measuring its redshift in an unbiased fashion. So we're, we're truly sampling the underlying spectroscopic redshift distribution of a photo Z bin. Another kind of information that's been suggested to include in your weak lensing analysis, this is uh, something that Jeff Newman has paper about, there's also others, is to just take some biased spectroscopic redshift survey, which is not necessarily representative of your lensing source galaxies, but nonetheless traces the matter distribution at some redshift uh, with some fidelity, and then you could use it to cross-correlate, for example, uh, a spectroscopic, a biased spectroscopic Z survey with the density field of your galaxies. Try to infer some information. All right, so these are the observables, and what statistics have people talked about making from these fields? Uh, so there's all, there's two point functions of basically any pair of this, this, or this, right? You can have Shear, shear, density, density. You can do that between photo Z and spectro Z samples. Uh, then there's three point information, which uh, we've heard about. And actually, I'm going to ignore the three point information in what I'm about to do the rest of this time because there are, you'll see it's messy enough at two point. But when you get to three point information, you start worrying about systematic errors. You have things like um, four kinds of intrinsic alignment uh, to deal with, right? There's a to use uh, Chris's notation, there's the GGG, the lensing, lensing, lensing signal that you're interested in, but there's also going to be GII, GGI, and III intrinsic alignments that you would have to somehow make sure aren't causing you problems. That's just one of the complications, so I won't get into that. And then there are higher order non Gaussian statistics like peak counting or something like that, and I won't talk about that here either. Uh, so we want to use all the observables and all of the two point statistics that we can come up with to constrain the broadest classes of models. We don't want our forecasts and our analysis to be tied to an assumption that there's a dark energy with W0 and WA. And we would like the analysis to be as flexible as possible. 
So what I'll talk about is just constraining the expansion history, not a specific dark energy formula, and trying to leave the growth function free as well. So I'll just leave it free as a function of redshift, but if you're modifying gravity, you might uh, chain, may leave it free as a function of scale as also. And we'd like to do all of these things, uh, have a very general analysis, while allowing for all the perversions of the observations that happen from measurement effects and uh, from astrophysical realities that we like to ignore in our papers sometimes. So what are these ugly things that we have to take account of? Uh, there are the measurement errors. So remember, we're measuring two things, right? We're measuring shapes, and we're also measuring redshifts for our targets. We can make mistakes on either of them. So the, the shape measurements we generally divide into additive, which could be re termed as contamination, shear, or multiplicative, which we sometimes call calibration. Uh, we could get the redshift distribution incorrect for some reason. Uh, either the core of the photos years we got wrong, or there are outliers that we didn't catch or measure properly. Uh, there are also systematic errors in the measurement of the tracer density, but I'm going to ignore that because the people have been doing galaxy density correlation functions for a long time and seem to have that pretty well under control. And then there is magnification bias, uh, which uh, is there. I wouldn't call that a systematic error, the fact that it's there. But when you are trying to analyze magnification uh, um, data, you have to know what the factor is right, that converts convergence into an excess density, right? which is, uh, what is it, 5q minus one or something. What's the usual formula, Ryan? Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, so you got to know all those factors if you're going to use your magnification bias data to infer cosmology. Right. Then there's astrophysical things that we often ignore. So uh, that, but these are all things, problems that have been pointed out by people uh, in the audience here. So there's finite accuracy in the theoretical predictions of the mass power spectrum, even with general relativity. And uh, God forbid we have to figure this out with some modified gravity, right? Uh, galaxy alignments have to be taken care of. Um, but also, uh, as I'll point out, there's more to it than that. We have to worry about the covariances of the galaxy alignments with each other and with the mass. Um, and the same thing is true with galaxy bias. If we're using density-density correlations, that the bias is an astrophysical systematic. Something else, though, people often in their papers will assume that there's a linear bias model, so you can just assign one bias to all the galaxies in a bin or all the galaxies on the sky. Of course, it could be scale dependent, but another thing to realize is that the power spectrum to fully specify needs a bias and a covariance with the other, a correlation coefficient with other kinds of galaxies. So those should be free parameters in our model, too. And a curvature we can't assume is zero. So anyway, if you try to do an analysis where you leave all these possible things as free parameters to marginalize over or systematic effects that you have to somehow exclude, and you look at all those different observables on the previous page, my intuition is no longer any good at figuring out uh, how these things are going to interact. Um, you can't uh, just, I can't at least guess my way to what the results are going to be once things get this complicated. And so that's what I mean by beyond the comprehensible, that when we go to analyze real data, uh, probably the likelihoods and, and things are going to be complicated enough that we're going to have to trust a lot of calculations and, and not have our intuition guide us. All right. So uh, another way of putting this is that somebody gives you a billion dollars and told you to come back with a, a value for, to, tell, to come back and tell you whether uh, there's really a cosmological constant or something else, uh, would you bet your reputation in that billion dollars on the assumption it being true that the universe is flat? Well, probably not. Or would you bet your reputation on the fact that there's no such thing as intrinsic galaxy alignments? Probably you wouldn't do that at this point either. Uh, you would have to include them in your analysis. Uh, would you bet your billion dollars that the galaxy alignments follow a particular model or something that came out of a simulation Probably not at this point either, right? Uh, would you trust that galaxy bias is constant at the 1% level, even in the linear regime? And uh, we've just seen a good reason from Lamb not to believe that. But uh, there are also, of course, uh, baryonic physics reasons not to believe it as well. Uh, so photosierrors, uh, all the analyses so far have assumed Gaussian photosierrors. We really 
can't bet our careers on that being true either, right? Uh, and another thing that uh, pops up is that um, photos years and galaxy bias may be correlated. That is to say that galaxies that have accurate photo Zs may have a different bias value from galaxies that have inaccurate photo Zs. And that means if you assume that the bias is <laughs> fixed over the width of the photo Z error distribution, you've made a potentially fatal mistake. Right? Lots of details. I won't go into the whole thing. So let me just show you a, a, a set of a way of doing an analysis that I think is pretty general and includes almost all these, allows us to under, not understand, but at least include in the calculation all these uh, subtle and devious effects. So uh, first thing I do is just take the universe, divide it up into a bunch of spherical shells to turn the continuous universe into a discrete problem. So I have shells that I'll uh, label by I here that live at certain redshifts. And then we take all the things that we're observing, galaxies, the CMB, whatever, and we are dividing them up into what I'll call sets. And usually, if it's a galaxy survey, you would assign them by photometric redshift, but you don't have to. And now each set of galaxies, say set number one, uh, the galaxies actually live on some set of shells. And there's a coefficient, which uh, or a probability, P alpha I, that a galaxy in set alpha lives at shell I. Right. So this P probability is a matrix, and I've colored in different elements here. So along the diagonal, if these are assigned by photo Z, you'd expect large elements, and then some smaller elements off the diagonal to show the spread of the photo Z distribution. And you may have some way off the diagonal here for photo Z outliers. Okay. Then, uh, but this formalism is more flexible if, for example, you've gone and done a 21 centimeter lensing survey then you know the galaxy redshifts quite accurately. And so in that case, you would just have a, a single unity element on that column. Or if you're looking at CMB lensing, you can include that in the same analysis because you just know that that's the lensing C to a source plane of recombination redshift. Okay. Then for each set of galaxies or targets that you're looking at, you have up to two observables. You can infer a convergence by looking at the distortions of that set or you can measure the density fluctuations on the sky of that set. Right? Now, uh, I think this is a general formulation here that the uh, convergence in a certain direction is, first of all, you have to sum over all the redshift slices that that galaxy set occupies. And then you have an intrinsic convergence, I'll call it, which is just the convergence inferred from intrinsic alignments. And then you have actually the uh, imposed lensing convergence. And I'm going to introduce a factor here uh, for shear calibration error. This has shown up in other people's papers. But of course, the uh, density is also affected by both an intrinsic density fluctuation and a magnification bias, and uh, with some factor here uh, that we have to know, and again, can differ from subset to subset. Now, one thing to notice here is that there's a nonlinear term, formally, right, that uh, the intrinsic density fluctuation or overdensity and the magnification bias one don't just add. They actually have a multiplicative term. I'm going to ignore that and just assume we can add them for, because it lets us do a Fourier transform. Um, and if you do a Fourier transform <clears throat> and also plug in the normal formula for the lensing convergence, uh, you can change those previous observables to this. And now uh, I've dropped the LM spherical harmonic indices from our two observables. But there is, there's one of these for each L and M. Uh, there's a mass field that's causing a deflection. Now, this formula here assumes that uh, the general relativity plus one equation holds and that matter fluctuations, labeled by M here, are the only thing sourcing the metric perturbations. But you could easily generalize that to many of the modified gravity things. Uh, A is this distance ratio. This is the curvature. Uh, and here's our systematic error there. So this is a model for these two fields. So here's the observables. Here's model parameters uh, and or some unknowns. We want to have some likelihood to do this analysis, either for the purpose of forecasting or for analyzing the data when we really get it. So the big simplifying assumption I'm going to make is that the Limber equation holds and that all of these fields, the mass fluctuations, the density fluctuations, and the convergence are Gaussian random fields. 
And in that case, uh, the, the likelihood of whatever you observe on the sky is completely described by these three different kinds of two-point correlations, right? And this looks complicated. I've just multiplied the things on the previous page together. But it's really pretty uh, straightforward. For example, if you look at the lensing-lensing convergence, you've got in here uh, something that's lensing squared. So this is the normal, what's called GG term, right? Then these are the two GI terms, and this is the II term. And uh, each of them have a bunch of geometric parameters in very simple algebraic forms and then a, a power spectrum. Right. So we could analyze all our data just with this formula, right? And we would derive a joint likelihood then on these geometric parameters, distances to each shell, uh, omega matter, omega curvature, some systematic stuff, these redshift probabilities, and then a whole bunch of free parameters, which are these power spectra at each k and at each z. Right? So you don't have to have any model at all of the power spectrum to do a lensing analysis. Right? You can leave it as totally free parameters and just do a geometric solution. But it's likely you're going to have some theory of gravity that uh, gives you a model of the, uh, a prior on the power spectra. And I'll get to that in a second. But uh, there's one other kind of information that doesn't appear in that Gaussian likelihood, and that's what the redshift distribution told you, the spectroscopic survey that you did. But that's easy to make a likelihood for, too, uh, as well. Let me just say, how do we plan to constrain the redshift distribution of the sources in our surveys? There's four ways I can think of that you do it. One is that you do a photometric, you measure the colors, and you assume that uh, Coleman, Wu, and Weedman or somebody told you what the spectra of galaxies are, and you just fit the colors to the template, and you decide that's the redshift, and that's good enough. So in that case, you have to trust that the people who study galaxies, I think none of whom are in this room, so we won't trust them, uh, that, that they got the colors right. Uh, and, and so you just trust photosies that they work. Well, the problem is, how do you quantify that trust? And I don't know how to do it. So what we're looking for instead is more quantitative information on the redshift distributions. And you can get it by looking at the uh, internal correlations of your galaxies between bins. You can cross-correlate your photometric survey with a spectroscopic survey. Uh, or you can just go out and start collecting redshifts, right? And if you uh, collect uh, a bunch of, say, n redshifts in out of uh, set alpha, right, and uh, you want to know what's the likelihood that I'll see a certain distribution of them on my different redshift shells, it's pretty easy to see what that likelihood is. Okay, it's just the probability uh, for each shell raised to the power of however many fell into that shell. Simple independent trials. And you can make a Fisher matrix out of that uh, if you treat these P's as parameters, and it's really simple. So that's how you incorporate spectroscopic information into a lensing forecast. Okay. All right, so now we have a model that can uh, describe all the data that we might collect, at least at the two-point level. But uh, it's got some parameters, some really interesting parameters, like the curvature and the distances. Uh, it's got some nuisance parameters, like the redshift distributions, these shear calibration errors, and these magnification bias factors that we somehow have to constrain. And then it's got a whole bunch of power spectra uh, in three-space three power spectra, one of which is interesting, the dark matter, the matter power spectrum, the rest of which are really annoying, like the cross-correlation between the galaxy density and the matter, or the cross-correlation between intrinsic alignment and galaxy density. So we can rewrite all those power spectra, the people, the way usually, well, you get a model for a power spectrum, and the matter power spectrum you can usually model pretty well. So the prior will be strong, right? But not necessarily at all k and z, at high k and at low z, the prior on these power spectrum parameters becomes weak. Uh, and you can estimate that. There are papers that estimate how wrong we can expect that to go. And then all of these two-point expectations, you can rewrite as the matter power spectrum plus some shot noise times these, uh, the, the normal bias and correlation coefficients. But what you see is there's a whole slew of them, right? There's galaxy density biases. There's intrinsic alignment bias and correlation coefficient. And then there's cross correlations between those as well. So when you look at this most generally, there's a lot of freedom there. So I'll call it parameter hell because you, if you really try to look at the analysis most generally, you can easily come up with thousands of free parameters for the models, right? of which you care about a few dozen. 
All right. Uh, so you got all these nuisance functions like galaxy bias. And uh, I just want to make a um, quick side to that. Usually, if you go to a bunch of engineers or somebody and ask them, uh, make me, well, they don't control galaxy bias, but suppose you wanted your engineers to tell you, you wanted to tell them how well they have to make the optics hold steady. Uh, they'll say, well, give me a number that allows it, that how much I can allow it to fluctuate, and I'll tell you how much that costs. So generally, they want to know an RMS fluctuation or something like that. But with these free systematic functions, the RMS can be a misleading thing, because if, if you've, say, taken the galaxy bias and assumed that it varies linearly with redshift in your model, you'll find that you can marginalize those two parameters out and with almost no loss of accuracy in your cosmological inferences because that model is just too simple. And what you'll then do is find out that you can tolerate a very large systematic and still end up with good cosmology, but you'll be wrong. Okay. Conversely, if you let that bias vary with... Uh, infinitely rapid variations, right? you'll find that you can tolerate a very large RMS fluctuation. And the reason is that the lensing kernel is broad and will average down those fluctuations. So again, you'll, uh, you'll be too confident. So any kind of systematic, it turns out that there is some scale of variation at which it's most damaging to you, where it's most likely to mimic cosmology. And that's when you're specifying a real experiment, what you have to find and set your specification for. So anyway, I spent a lot of time doing this kind of really dull stuff. Um, anyway, so this I gave you a bunch of equations. And once you have a likelihood for the data, you can make a Fisher matrix and you can forecast anything, right? Uh, so I've written the code that does this, that generates these 3,000 element Fisher matrices. Or, and uh, it's just linear algebra. You can marginalize away the things you're not interested in and see what your constraints are. Uh, the one thing I, it's not in my code yet is the magnification bias. I'm still working on that. Uh, but once you have this and you've marginalized away all these astrophysical and instrumental nuisance parameters, now you've got a Fisher matrix that's, uh, in my case, over the distance, the expansion history, and over the growth history. And we could easily include some post-GR parameters in there as well. And uh, you can project that onto any kind of dark energy model that you want and form whatever figure of merit you want. Uh, so uh, I've done this, and I've been playing with it, and it, it's uh, a very large dimensional space of uh, investigations to conduct, and so I won't show you a lot of it because uh, it gets kind of mind-numbing. But uh, I can say that a lot of the things that, yeah, question? So I was just confused by your statement about the... Oh, the, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, so have you imposed, so you have these free bias yeah. parameters, for example, Um, well, here's the idea. So let's just take bias as an example, right? So let's say you want to do it versus redshift, but it could be scale dependence either. Uh, so suppose you assume the nominal bias is 1, and then you ask, uh, how much freedom should I give that? So if you let it uh, do this, OK, then uh, it turns out lensing probably won't care about any of that because lensing is generally averaging over fairly broad regions. And so something that has an RMS of 0 0.5 fluctuation will turn out to have very little impact on the inferred cosmology that you get because the lensing kernel is smoothing it out. Okay. So you go to the, well, there's no engineers for bias, but you, know, you decide that if bias changes by 0.5, it doesn't hurt my experiment. But if you had the bias actually doing this, it could really kill you because this might mimic the effect of some cosmology quite effectively. So that's what I'm saying. And so what I've done is uh, made a family of functions that have different scales of variation and found the scale of variation at which the, a given RMS is most damaging to cosmology. And yeah. so, so your, your bias model is not just these bins in the Z band, yeah, my, but it is some function that Actually, my bias model is, is pretty simple. It's just uh, stepwise or linearly interpolated between a set of nodes okay, in Z. So what okay. you're saying is that you have a rule about the smoothness of that interpolation. I, I redo the analysis, changing the, the spacing of the nodes, right, okay. to find the spacing of nodes that's worst. Could you do that 
do the same thing with just uh, specifying the correlations between the gens? Oh, you could, you know, maybe choose a Fourier representation or, you know, anything that gives you a, a range of scales, right? Polynomials. Okay. Uh, so with this, uh, lots of software um, and that gives these results out that are, it's, it's kind of a black box, but at least the nice thing about it is that I have been able to convince myself, not <laughs> anyone else yet, that a lot of the results that you all have derived still hold true when we increase the complexity of the problem. So for example, there's a, a, a dragon, uh, it's a paper, uh, where we said, okay, how much calibration error in the shear can we tolerate, in which he found that anything below a part in 10 to the third is unimportant, and that the data actually self-calibrates itself to the equivalent of 10 to the minus 2, so that that range between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2 is what you have to work. And that's still true in the current analysis. Uh, so there are other um, many papers that have shown that doing this joint analysis of galaxy density and shear is much more powerful and, in particular, more robust to systematic errors than just looking at the shear tomography itself. That remains true. Uh, Sarah wrote a paper showing that once you allow intrinsic alignments into the data, the requirements on your knowledge of photometric redshifts get much tighter, and that I've also seen. And Jeff Newman has suggested that you can weaken the requirements on your spectroscopic survey by just cross-correlating the uh, galaxies with a spectroscopic set. And I've seen that that works quite effectively for the core part of the photometric redshift distribution. But what I haven't been able to uh, figure out yet is whether it's going to work for detecting outliers. Um, magnification bias is easily confused with this correlation, uh, especially for outlier redshifts. So here's just an example of results from this program. So, this is a, a simple, uh, familiar dark energy task force figure of merit, um, product of errors, uh, the inverse of the error ellipse area in the W naught W plane uh, for LSST. So here's what I've assumed about LSST, and you see it's a very long list of assumptions now, because I have to worry not only about how many square degrees in galaxies, uh, but also have to worry about, okay, how bad are we going to let our errors in the theoretical power spectrum be? And uh, how bad are we going to let our shear calibration errors be? And what are we going to assume about bias? So one thing that I've done here is I've split the bias uh, into the linear and nonlinear regimes with some smooth transition between. And I'm assuming that uh, we're going to know uh, that we can place a prior on the bias of the galaxies that's about 5% in the uh, linear regime and 10% in the nonlinear regime. That's what your a priori knowledge would be. And then there are other things about intrinsic alignment. You have to do the same thing and ask, for instance, how covariant is intrinsic alignment with the mass distribution? Okay. If it's completely covariant, then II and GI are degenerate with each other, and you only have to solve for one of them. Uh, how big a spectroscopic survey would you have? Well, I'm analyzing LSST here, so I'm assuming that we'll be limited to ground-based spectroscopy for following up our galaxies. And ground-based spectroscopic surveys are not complete any deeper than 23rd and a half magnitude and are not complete beyond redshift about 1.7. So you can only do the highest quality photo Z calibration for the, these galaxies. Uh, to go fainter than that, you're going to have to rely on some kind of cross-correlation technique and hope that it works. And uh, so here's another redshift survey that you might do that's not complete, but uh, at least spans some redshift range. All right, so uh, just to show you how these things work out, the, the green bar here is the figure of merit that you would obtain just from shear shear tomography, ignoring all systematic errors completely, and uh, adding in a font prior. Then I start turning on systematic errors. So now I'm going to uh, allow the power spectrum theory to be inaccurate at the expected level, and the shear calibration to be uh, varying by 1%, and the galaxy to have biases that we don't know exactly. But at the same time, instead of just looking at shear, shear, I'm going to look at galaxy, shear, and galaxy, galaxy correlations. And you can see that the addition of these two observables pretty much cancels out the deleterious effect of these systematics, that the figure of merit actually comes out about the same. 
And then I'm going to turn on uh, the worst systematics, all right, which are intrinsic alignment and photo Z errors, uh, photo Z uncertainties. But at the same time, I'm going to add a new data set, which is the, this uh, spectroscopic information over here and the cross-correlation of the imaging <laughs> data with this spectroscopic sample. And then you see that not only does the uh, figure of merit not drop, but it actually goes up. Right? And uh, it, it actually improves the situation. And the reason is that the galaxy redshift survey is allowing you to uh, break a fair number of degeneracies between things like galaxy bias and um, photo Z distributions and things. Um, so the ones there before. Down if you had a spectroscopic survey. So you don't need a complete spectroscopic survey to understand this correctly. But yeah. if there is a, some unknown galaxy population you are observing but not targeting um, by complete, I don't mean that you need to observe every single galaxy, right? I just mean that you need to do a redshift survey that gives you back a redshift for 100% of the ones that you try. But, right? yeah, imagine having some blue population where you don't okay. cannot... Yeah, so then you get a blue population where you only succeed at 70% of the redshifts. So you have two options. You either decide that I'm going to guess that the 30% I missed have the same redshift distribution as the 70% I got, and I'm going to ignore the problem, mm -hmm. right, which is a little dangerous. Right? Or if it's really the blue galaxies that are giving you the problem, you could choose to exclude the blue galaxies from the analysis altogether. Right? Don't use them for lensing because your spectroscopy is not complete. Right? And that's actually what this one is. Right? So if I take the LSST survey and I cut it back, to where it's only using the galaxies that meet these criteria. Okay, that's the most damaging thing. And so right now there's a big open question in my mind, which is can you exceed this limit and still understand the redshift outlier problem well enough without having this very complete spectroscopic survey? And that's something that I don't have an answer to. In each case, how much did it go down before it came up again? I don't know. I, I didn't run it independently. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, well, particularly if you turn this on without having this, you would be in bad shape. Right. So that's, that's because you're losing, so you're losing density and losing depth? Is that last point? Here? Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. That's, that's really good. Those is more, more important? In this case, uh, I would guess the density because the depth is a relatively mild function. Uh, I mean, the, the, the full LSST goes to about 25th magnitude, and then I cut it back to 23 and a half. What fraction of galaxies do you use? What fraction? How many galaxies? Oh, what fraction of those are in here? Yeah. I think it lowers the effective density on the sky from 30 to about 10 or 12 per square minute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, that was the only result of any kind I have to show you. So, uh, but I've been using this to analyze a lot of experiments and try to decide what we should do. Uh, so in summary, I got this Frankenstein model here, which is taken from the parts of other people's papers, right? Uh, I extract the best body parts and try to put them all into one forecasting model. Uh, and, except it is limited to a Gaussian likelihood function. Uh, and I'm using it for forecasting. Uh, it's extensible, as far as I know, to any set of lensing experiments that I've heard proposed. So you can analyze a joint observation. You know, you can ask what will happen when I have CMB lensing and a galaxy lensing survey in the foreground of that, right? Which could be an extremely useful combination. Or what if I have some spectroscopic surveys and some photo Z, et cetera. Uh, and it's straightforward to extend this to any gravity modification for which you could tell me the two-point functions the, um, uh, of the uh, phi plus psi, basically. Right? That's all that really matters. Um, and uh, because the only assumption that's really built into this is that we have a Robertson-Walker metric with scalar perturbations, right? and that the photons follow those geodesics of them. Uh, so this really confirms, and in my mind, it amplifies the importance of combining um, these lensing surveys with density galaxy surveys on the same part of the sky and demonstrates that when you do that kind of thing, it makes you 
a lot more immune to a lot of systematic errors that you might have thought were going to kill you. Okay. Now, the, uh, the open questions to me are what I said about the photos, the outliers. Uh, I am not convinced yet that you can run a high precision weak lensing experiment beyond the capabilities of spectroscopic redshift surveys. Uh, there's something that I left out of this called additive shear, uh, which I haven't analyzed, but uh, Adam Amara and Alexander appreciate have a pretty good paper on that. Uh, and then the big question that's a point of discussion maybe is, is, is this kind of thing the basis, is this the way we're going to analyze the data when it comes in? Are we going to use this two-point likelihood function with this geometric basis? Because, uh, uh, you know, some of you have experience in analyzing the CMB, and that was a pretty big numerical challenge, right? And that is going to be like falling off a log compared to analyzing these uh, three-dimensional weak lensing data to do full likelihood analysis. Uh, and then the thing that I did leave out also is, is the three-point information. And we know that there's a lot of information in there, but my question is, will we end up with a practical way in which we can use that information and not be too worried about some intrinsic alignment at the three-point level or something else that, that's killing us, or some systematic that shows up at three points, which I haven't thought of any yet, but given t give me an hour or two, I probably could invent some bizarre observational effect that would create a three-point function. So, uh, so that's it. Yes, yes, so, right, that's what that G, uh, that G observable was the sky plane density, galaxy density fluctuation. And how much information does this Oh, it's a lot, it's a, it's, it's a big help, and it's especially having that, it's, uh, and cross, of course, there's the cross correlation between the density and the lensing, right, which is also known confusingly as galaxy, galaxy lensing, right? Um, but uh, when you put those things together, you, you get a lot more than you do just from sheer, sheer correlation. Just, right. just to clarify the, the two figures in the mm -hmm. last two lines, that was just the difference in the, uh, the uh, fair spectroscopic sample? That yeah, the, the big, nice-looking line right. was when I assumed that we could use every galaxy that LSST can image and get a photo Z for. Uh, in other words, it's assuming that cross-correlation techniques will tell you the redshift distribution to the accuracy so that you would using, want. you're still using some biased spectroscopic sample to cross-correlate. That's right. I'm assuming that you have... Because uh, you'll yeah. always have that, presumably, right? You'll have That's true. I don't remember. So the bottom line is where I just only use the galaxies that are uh, members of the complete spectroscopic family. Uh, so, yeah, you, I assume there that you have about 10 square degrees, a few hundred thousand galaxies at, at a wide range of redshifts to do the cross-correlation. I think that's a biased sample. And, and that kind of data almost exists today. And was that, um, did you put in for this the outliers? No. And the reason is that there's a lot of off-diagonal spaces in that original matrix, right? I mean, if you were going to do this problem completely, you would have hundreds and hundreds of new parameters out there for every possible kind of outlier. Oh, you mean all the non-zero off-diagonal elements were fixed to zero? Yes, in the analysis I showed you, right? Because I'm scared to put them all in. But not, not, the, not the core ones. The core ones are left as three parameters, and those are being solved for in this. Yeah. Right. So, so there's already several hundred of the, these parameters being solved for from internally from the data. Uh, but I, I haven't done the harder problem. But, I mean, if you um, I don't. I suspect if you, so this is the favorable situation in my view, is that uh, you decide that you're only going to have outliers in a f certain few places. That, you know, you know that you're going to confuse some redshift three galaxies for redshift near zero galaxies, for instance. And then if you only have to put a few of those parameters into your matrix to float, I bet they'll, they'll be solved for self calibrated away very efficiently. So that's what I would consider the good outcome is when you know in advance where the outliers are going to be uh, and then you can handle it if they're not too many. But if you had to leave the whole problem free, yeah. I was a 
a little bit confused about what you said about the II and the GI terms. You said you think that if the intrinsic alignments were correlated with the convergence course, then the two would the two effects would be the same. But yeah. But one of them you can do something about if you've got the photo set, remove pairs that are close together. In, in well, actually, he, I mean, the photos he's let you handle both of those problems. It's just not as straightforward for the GI, right? But uh, you have a, a mass distribution, right? And you have an intrinsic convergence distribution, right? So in general, you, the uh, power spectrum has three different elements, right? Uh, and uh, if we're just looking at the intrinsic correlations. And uh, if we write this as the mass power spectrum times uh, okay, we just renormalize this by this element. Um, if R is 1, there's only one degree of freedom here, right? So in other words, if, if the mass and the intrinsic alignment are completely correlated with each other, then uh, if you looked at the close by pairs and measured their autocorrelation function, you would know everything. You would have figured out the GI also. But of course, we don't know whether that's going to be so I don't, uh, in this analysis, there is GG and GI. There's two different degrees of freedom, but I express them by these two numbers. Yeah. All right. Let's ask Gary again. <laughs> so lunch.